How are you all doing? It's Peter McMahon here, European Industrial Tillers. Um, I'm just going to do a quick vlog on ventilation and duct sizing. Um, so, quick disclaimer. Um, if you are uh, designing a system, you uh, either should be a building engineer yourself or employ the services of a building engineer. Um, these vlogs are really to assist building engineers with revision or those that are considering going into the field of building engineering to give them a bit of an insight into what's involved, um, or perhaps for clients to get an understanding of what the building engineers have to do. Um, but again, like I said, please do not take this on board yourself. Um, it takes engineers many, many years of study to learn this, and many, many more years of experience to perfect uh, their, their skills. So um, with that being said, um, the information is given in good faith, um, but without responsibility. Um, and uh, we do want to try and help those in the uh, industry uh, wherever we can. So that's what this is all about. So um, if you are designing a system that requires ventilation, um, you really need to look at uh, two methods of checking the uh, volume uh, airflow rate. So um, you're looking at um, the minimum liters per person, uh, those liters per second per person. And that can vary depending upon the uh, installation, uh, the application, the type of the environment. Um, it can be quite low or quite high. There's consequences on either. And um, the higher the, the volume flow rate you use, um, the more comfortable the environment is to work in. Um, but the consequences are it will be more expensive to deliver that uh, higher volume of flow rate. Um, the equipment is more expensive. The, um, duct sizing is more expensive, the AHU is more expensive, the installation is more expensive. Um, you can try and scale that down, but there's a consequence, I'll go into that now in a second, regarding velocity. Um, if you try and deliver a higher flow rate in a lower volume, or sorry, in a lower um, size ductwork, you will have a higher velocity and the noise levels can become a problem. Um, so like I said, I'll go through that now in a second. Um, so the two things I mentioned, one is the minimum liters per second per person. Um, and the other is the minimum air changes per hour. So, and by the way, you should use both calculations, do both calculations, compare them, and use whichever is the greater of the two. So, for example, um, I'm doing a little project here at the moment for um, toilets that require um, ventilation. Um, but by the way, um, with um, the environment that you're ventilating, you may want it in a positive pressure or a negative pressure. So, for example, if it's pharmaceutical or some area where you don't want any contamination coming into the room, you would typically have a positive pressure or a clean room environment. Um, however, if it's toilets, you don't, know, you don't want a positive pressure where the, it smells and odours are, are leaking out into the surrounding working environment. So toilets will be on negative pressure. Kitchens will be on negative pressure. Um, and there's very specific guidelines for kitchens, by the way. Um, so with regard to toilets, we're going to be on negative pressure. Um, by about 10%. So we are looking at, um, you look at the, the volume of the room, so your length by your breadth by your height, and um, we multiply that by our minimum air changes per hour. Now you can look at SIBSI guidelines, um, and I think they say something like four to six air changes per hour for a toilet. Um, again, my recommendation without responsibility is you use 10 air changes per hour for a toilet. So um, that will be our um, multiplier volume by our air changes. That gives you a volume flow rate in meters cubed per second. We then, um, or sorry, meters cubed per hour, we divide by 360 below, and that will convert it to our uh, meters cubed per second. Um, we then do um, a cross check if we look at the number of, let's say, cubicles or potential people that could be in the toilets, and um, multiply that by our minimum meters per second. So for example, if we were to say 10 or 12 meters per second, um, 10, 10 liters per second, by the way, would be quite common for office environments. Um, maybe as low as, uh, as 8, perhaps, and maybe as high as 12. And as I said earlier, there's consequences of either. So um, if we multiply that out, compare the two, you will find the 10 air changes per hour are going to be much higher than the liters per second per person. So that's what we're going to go with. So um, I'll show you a uh, drawing here. I have another camera just set up on the side. Uh, if I can swap over here. Okay, so it's just sitting on the side. I know it's not a great picture, but hopefully you can see this okay. 
So actually, I'll lift it down just so you can see it a bit better. So this is um, an arrangement where we have a number of diffusers scattered around. Um, well, they're not actually scattered. They're, they're very strategically placed. Um, uh, and, and you need to be con uh, conscious of uh, it's, it's a whole field in itself in relation to diffuser sizing and spacing um, and ensuring that the air velocity uh, coming down to people isn't very high or you'll get drafts and uncomfortable uh, environments for people. So um, especially in a walking environment where you're sitting, there's an office. So um, as you can see here, we, we strategically um, have laid out our diffusers in, in uh, these are going to toilets. Um, we index each section and it's very important you understand that the, the maximum velocity uh, needs to be adhered to. So on, let's say, a, a main uh, riser or main branch uh, from, from Pantum, uh, we would typically use eight meters cube per second. Uh, sorry, meters per second. We're talking about uh, velocity, not volume flow here. Okay? Um, on sub branches, you would use a um, or main, main branch coming off a main riser, you would use a six meters per second velocity. On the sub branches, four and a half. And on the final uh, branches to your grills, your diffusers, two and a half meters per second, or meters per second, sorry, it's a habit. Um, so two and a half meters a uh, second maximum velocity. And that's very important, okay? So um, I will just flick back here to the other screen. Actually, no, I won't. What I'll do is I'll actually show you, um, this is a, a duct sizing chart. So now I know the software on this program is to do a lot of this much easier nowadays, um, but I'm just showing it the old way. Even if you're using software, uh, you really um, should have learned how to do it properly with, with um, uh, charts. So, you, so you, you can always cross reference if you suspect there's something wrong with your software. So um, the other rule of thumb. So firstly, the rule of thumb, as I said to you there, is the maximum velocity uh, going to your diffusers. Two and, a half, two, two and a half meters per second. And the other uh, rule of thumb is one uh, uh, pascal per meter you should use as, as your maximum pressure drop in your ducting. Um, so if we look at one pascal, you can see it here, and we follow this up, and let's say we have a volume flow rate of one and a half, uh, sorry, one, let's say 0.15 uh, meters cubed per second. Because that's what that's what I've worked out for for one of these toilets. So we put your ruler on your uh, duct sizing chart. We go up to one and a half, so point one or sorry, point one five uh, meters cube per second. We can draw a line over here. We want to ensure, um, as I said, our velocity to the diffuser is is less than two and a half. So if we look at two to three there on the chart, and I know you can't see this brilliantly on on the, the on the camera there, but if you have a chart and you follow this, you'll understand. So two and a half, we follow that down, you can see there. So this is our intersection here. So with this point, we can draw a line down from there. And where that um, drops down, we can see 0 0.2, 0 0.3. So I would say 0 0.33. So if we said not 0 0.33, that is our pressure drop per meter squared. Okay, so that's, that, that, that's perfectly fine. Now, if we then go back up to our point here and we want to size the ducting, we then follow, this is the duct sizing here, 0 0.25, 0 0.3. So we follow this up, you can use your ruler again if you wish. So uh, air rulers, if you're a client of ours, free air rulers for everyone. So we can draw a line up there. And we can see that that's about 0.255. So I would say that's, 255 millimeter okay so if you are using your your um uh, your index so let's say here we have 0.15 uh, our pressure drop we said is not 0.33 and the duct diameter is 255 millimeters now bear in mind that's round duct sizing if you are using um, very often you will have round ducting in certain areas. Um, it's, round ducting is cheaper. Um, now, before I switch back, I'll just show you. So for example, 
you would typically have rectangular duct <clears throat> Um, in a lot of areas. So in suspended ceilings, you could be restricted for space and you need to, <coughs> excuse me, you need to use uh, rectangular ducting. And um, just typically rule of thumb, um, you shouldn't use a ratio of four. So for let's say one, uh, 100 mil high, you shouldn't have more than 400 mil wide. Um, so we, we can use these charts to convert from a round duct to a rectangular duct. Okay, and again, like I said, you're, you're, you're looking at specific applications. i um, just going to switch over here. Okay, so um, that's really just going to give you a very basic overview in relation to how you do your duct sizing. Um, so, hope you found that a bit useful. If you have any queries on it, uh, feel free to give me a call. Um, we don't charge for these vlogs. Um, I do them just to try and help people out a little bit. Um, uh, but obviously, if you have uh, any live inquiries for chillers, heat pumps, air handling units, heat recovery units, fan coil units, uh, and so on, um, European Industrial Chillers, EICL.E, is um, the company that uh, I represent. And um, uh, please feel free to give us a call and send your inquiries our way, and we will be delighted to have you out in any way we can. Okay, thank you. Uh, the email, by the way, is uh, inquiry, I-N-Q-U-I-R-Y, at eicl.e or chillers at eicl.e. Thanks. And um, by the way, subscribe um, to uh, my YouTube channel there, and you'll get uh, notifications every time I do another vlog such as this. Thank you. And um, also, just to add, um, this is the supply um, uh, ducting arrangement. You will typically have another ducting arrangement for your extract. And like I said, depending upon whether you're positive or negative pressure, um, you will uh, have, a, have a, an arrangement um, for your extract. Um, on the extract, you don't necessarily have to have ducting going to every extract grill. Very often, if you have a suspended ceiling, you would um, typically um, use your suspended ceiling essentially as an open duct. So uh, you're extracting uh, from a given area from your uh, suspended ceiling so that, that that's your extract in itself and um, you can't always do that and um, in kitchens for example you need very specific uh, fire rated ducting because you could have grease and so on um, and mist uh, being being extracted but there, there's special filtration and uv um, protection and so on involved but like i said there's very specific guidelines in relation to kitchens um, so um, yes you'll have a completely separate arrangement and um, that will be going to your extract uh, fan from um, from that particular area. Um, and you should, of course, try and uh, use uh, heat recuperation. I'll do a completely separate vlog on air handling units with regard to heat recovery and so on, because there's all different uh, types you can do there um, and the specific ERP regulations um, that you need to adhere to. So whether it's a plate type exchanger, uh, run around coil, run around coil is typically the least efficient, but for specific applications, you might need them. If it's a hospital theater, for example, you need absolutely no contamination of the air from the extract to the air supply. So one well coil is pretty much the only way to do that. Um, some people uh, will use plate heat exchangers for similar type applications and you again there's tricks in relation to positive pressure um, to eliminate the extract contaminating the supply. Um, or thermal wheels um, is by far the most efficient um, and they can also be, well there's, there's different types of thermal wheels but uh, they can be used to reduce the actual cooling load as well. Um, uh, but again, that's a very, very dedicated uh, vlog in itself. So um, again, uh, hopefully you find that of some use and um, sure give me a call if you need.